As we approach the end of 2021, we can look back at the previous two years of restrictions, lockdowns, COVID tests and vaccination lines, not to mention all the political strife, or we can look to the unknown ahead to the new year. But let us pause for a moment and enjoy the now, a holiday season that should be livelier and by nearly all factors better than last year's. After all that's gone on, we could use some old fashioned holiday cheer. This is Tom Willard with the Oxford Comment. On today's episode, in the spirit of the holiday season, we'll be discussing two subjects integral to various end of the year celebrations, the alcoholic beverages consumed on a cold winter's night and the traditions surrounding Christmas, sacred, folk, secular, and all around strange traditions too. Our first guests are the editors of the recently published Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails. With over a thousand entries from 150 contributors, including many delicious recipes and mixing guides, it is a perfect book for the holidays. We are pleased to welcome Editor-in-Chief David Wondrich and Associate Editor Noah Rothbaum to talk about their book, The Growth of Cocktail Culture, and some of their favourite holiday drinks from around the world. Welcome, and thank you very much for joining us here on The Oxford Comment. Would you like to give us a quick introduction to yourselves and your newly published book, The Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, please? Well, I'm uh, David Wondrich. I'm the Editor-in-Chief, a drinks writer for... 20 years. Uh, I used to work for American Esquire, as we say, or Esquire, as you guys say. And uh, I worked there for a very long time. And now I'm uh, the uh, chief drinks columnist at the Daily Beast's half full section, which is uh, available worldwide and uh, a, a great fun job. And uh, with me, of course, is my associate editor, Noah Rothbaum. All right. Thank you for having us on. Um, Noah Rothbaum, the associate editor of the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails. I'm also the editor of Half Full, the Daily Beast Drink section. And Dave and I host our own podcast called Life Behind Bars. So the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails is an attempt to get the whole world of uh, distilled spirits and how they're consumed between the covers of a book. It's not so easy because it's a really big world. It's much bigger than we're usually told. Uh, There's a lot more distilling going on than uh, what you can find in Duty Free. Uh, And, uh, you know, from uh, sugarcane spirits distilled in villages all throughout the tropics to uh, homemade fruit brandies in the Balkans to all all kinds of stuff. It's really fascinating. It's a it's a world of craft and, and also of industry. And we tried to cover both. And since this is the first edition, Oxford obviously has a companion to wine and and one for beer with our, it was edited by our dear friend Garrett Oliver, um, who who suggested Dave to be the editor of the Spirits and Cocktails Companion, you know, has been sort of a hard thing because, you know, uh, you know, that, that first edition trying to decide of all the things that people have drunk over the years in bars and at home and have, you know, distilleries have made and people have made at home, what should be contained in the book? And that that in itself was a sort of monumental task that I think took several years with the help of our editorial board. And, um, you know, it's uh, we've, we've tried to get as much as we possibly could <laughs> into 900 pages, which sounds like a lot of pages, but turns out to be uh, maybe not even enough (laughs) for this project. (laughs) I mean, we've got entries on famous distillers and famous bartenders, famous bars, famous cocktails. And, you know, all of these are sourced with uh, with sources given and little bibliographies. And we're trying to to uh, set the record straight in many cases. Plus, we've got the science of distilling, the science of aging. We've got the history of distilling. We've got the history of the spirits trade. We've we've got so many different topics. Uh, it's really, uh, uh, you know, whiskey, rum, brandy, gin. All of those are covered in some detail and in multiple entries. So you can imagine the the number of entries really stacks up. I mean, we've got 1,150 entries, and and as Noah says, we we really kind of don't think that's enough. <laughs> that's, that's really impressive. Um, so over the last decade or so. There's been a growth in cocktail culture. So to what do you attribute the rise in popularity? Well, when when I get asked uh, questions like this, uh, my my answer is, have you been around for the last decade and a half? You know, <laughs> it's, it's not been a fun time. It's been extremely stressful. The 
the world has kind of gone a little bit off its axis. And one of the little things people can do is gather together in small groups and maybe, you know, have a have a well-made drink where they can sit and appreciate something made just for them uh, by somebody who cares about what they're doing in a, in a civilized atmosphere that, that that's pleasant and uh, people aren't yelling and waving signs at each other and and so on and so forth, where the world is at peace and, and at harmony. So that's, I think, one of the, the greatest things about this is uh, it's a small luxury, a well-made cocktail that is a great way of decompressing, you know, when taken, obviously when taken in moderation, as you tend to see at these uh, top cocktail bars, people tend to be fairly civilized in their behavior. Yeah, and I think that we, you know, some of this is cyclical. We've also kind of saw a perfect storm of, you know, events and trends coming together with people really wanting handcrafted things, artisanal things, small batch. You know, un unfortunately, spirits like rye whiskey and the cocktail itself almost had a completely die before they came back. And, and everybody loves a rebirth. So, you know, fortunately, we're, we're, we're on the upswing now. Um, and, and we've seen, you know, one of the things I think that came through working on this book is just all of the you know kind of uh, cycles of the popularity of spirits and cocktails over the last several hundred years and really we're, we're in i would argue just the beginning stages of a new golden age for for really distillation mm -hmm. and drinks and hopefully that will last for many years to come <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll remain popular and, and we won't go back to drinking what we used to drink not that long ago um, so are there some recent cocktail trends that you are seeing this autumn that you can share with us? And what would you say is the must-have cocktail that everyone is ordering or making at the minute? Well, right now the must-have cocktail appears to be the vodka espresso, which, or otherwise known as the uh, the espresso martini, uh, which uh, was invented in London by Dick Bradsell, a, the great uh, pioneering modern London bartender, unfortunately no longer with us. But that has suddenly in the last uh, six months has has just come rocketing back from the B list of cocktails to be uh, the most the thing in most demand everywhere. Partly, I suspect, because it's heavily caffeinated and uh, people, uh, especially younger, the younger uh, the younger drinkers who are now out in bars again like their coffee and you know they they like a little bit of alcohol with that, which is understandable. But uh, so that that's. That's kind of a surprising trend. Uh, other than that, things have kind of uh, that, that were happening before the pandemic have continued to happen, but in, in kind of two opposite directions, pulling against each other. One side, and uh, I'd be curious to hear what you have to think about this, Noah. Uh, one side is is people who want things to be simple and really bedrock as possible. Let's get rid of all the frills and, uh, and, and the staginess and just really get into the basics and uh, our community and uh, have things be very uh, low to the ground. And the other side is, well, I've spent all this time at home and uh, I want to go out and really see something. <laughs> so I want the most elaborate drinks. I want the most uh, over the top stuff. And those were already trends, but now they're really kind of polarized and pulling uh, very strongly. I think uh, that, that, that's that's what I see yeah. it anyway. I think and, you're right. I think you're right, Dave. I mean, like we, you know, before the pandemic, we saw like a real rise in popularity of um, the old fashioned, which is kind of the original cocktail, right? It's spirits, mm -hmm. sugar, water, and bitters, and which is essentially the definition of cocktail. That that has come roaring back over the last decade, which. I never thought would happen, um, uh, but I'm very glad it did. And we see a lot of bars, you know, across the U.S. really serving old fashions and, and probably around the world. The Negroni has also really grown in popularity the last few years, which is, you know, generally three equal parts of Campari, um, gin and sweet vermouth. Obviously, you know, both professional home bartenders tend to uh, modify the, the, the sort of that ratio to their own tastes. And then, you know, I, I think this time of year, we really see things like the hot toddy. You know, there's a lot of chatter about the hot toddy as soon as it starts to get a little cold, which is sort of a polarizing drink. I know Dave is a fan of the original hot toddy, which is basically just whiskey and water, maybe a 
little hey, bit of don't forget the sugar now <laughs> a little sugar and then i was gonna say a uh just a little squeeze of, of lemon peel over the top and then as you know dave you were talking about before we also see people basically adding everything in their bar cart to the hot toddy to make some kind of crazy monstrosity that includes <laughs> cider and all types of sugars and flavors so i mean that 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 takes a lot of uh, up a, a lot of real estate on social media these days and then uh you know as we edge towards the holidays you know obviously eggnog um is, is a big deal and um even i know it's a little bit out of season but uh, um irish coffee which we often associate with st patrick's day in america you know is, is one of my favorite you know fall winter drinks since it's so warming and so simple i mean the secret is you making good coffee using good whiskey but only not as much as you think and then whipping fresh cream and a little bit of uh brown sugar syrup and uh it's it's a delight Due to the exponential rise of TikTok and social media during nationwide lockdowns, how much of an increase in following has mixing drinks and cocktails had since the pandemic? Well, it's kind of striking. There, there's been a, there been a huge bump in interest in cocktails. Cocktail books have sold like way better than they usually do. Home bar gear, uh, you know, TikTok channels. Uh, I did a, 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 for the first 75 days of lockdown, I did a drink of the day with photos on Twitter that was widely followed, I mean, for me anyway, and uh, it seemed to like gather a, a virtual community, like of, of people who missed their bars and wanted to, to be somewhere where there were drinks and where they could have a drink with other people, even if they were all in lockdown. So I think... Uh, the virtual community stepped in as much as possible, and, and that was actually quite a bit. And I think we'll, we sort of saw people really kind of just like making sourdough bread that they really got into making drinks at home. I mean, obviously out of sort of necessity because a lot of bars and restaurants were closed and and even the ones that stayed open, you know, uh, were kind of streamlining their service. So mm -hmm. I think people really kind of got into making drinks at home. I mean, I, I don't think it's a perfect analogy, but kind of like during Prohibition in America where, you know, where we really saw the sale of cocktail shakers to consumers, you know, happen for the first time and people really started to make drinks at home then too. And I think we saw a similar thing. I mean, personally, after several months of drinking my own drinks and eating my own food, I was more than happy to go back to restaurants and bars or to get takeout from other neighborhoods. <laughs> so I think that, you know, we've also, um, a lot of us are very happy to, to go back and have, uh, you know, drinks, you know, that made that, that we don't normally make for ourselves or um, twists that, you know, we haven't thought of. And, and that's also been really nice and kind of reminded us of how wonderful it is to go to your local pub or bar and see the bartender and see your friends and other locals and the rather regulars and enjoy, you know, a, a properly poured pint or a well-made cocktail, you know, in the company of other people. And it's that kind of, uh, you know, the conversation and the storytelling that, that, that I miss the most, um, obviously during, during the lockdowns and that hurt the most and, um, now ever grateful that it's back and hopefully will never go away again. <laughs> so coming up to the holiday season, there's a few cocktails like eggnog, hot buttered rum punches mm -hmm. as well that tend to be popular this time of year. Can you talk about the, the origin of these cocktails and how they came to be kind of known as holiday cocktails? And are there different types of cocktails that are popular in different countries around the holidays? Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, <laughs> well, it starts with punch. Punch is the <laughs> beginning of the family tree for modern, for the modern, uh, you know, drink based on, on spirits because uh, it was the first popular drink uh, to, to spread around the world. Uh, that incorporated uh, that incorporated distilled spirits. So uh, it's very old and it's got a very old tradition. And it was always a communal drink. It started as a communal drink. And and uh, once people switch to you drink your drink and I'll drink my drink, they still saved it for holidays and special occasions where everybody had to come together. 
So uh, punch is, is, is great for that. You can make it hot, you can make it cold. Uh, I love making a, a simple rum punch or a rum and brandy punch, which is an 18th century London specialty, uh, maybe with a little bit of uh, port wine in it. And then, you know, sugar, uh, lemon peel, lemon juice, and water, done. Uh, very, very simple drink, even with multiple spirits in it. Uh, th that's kind of bedrock. Uh, the American drinks are the eggnog uh, that that's been a, a holiday drink and a holiday tradition in America for over 200 years. It was always what you drank on Christmas and on New Year's Day was you got together and drank eggnog or a little bit later. It's it's hot version Tom and Jerry, which is a, a fabulous ritual. You all gather around a bowl and you drink little mugs full of whipped egg batter and spirits and uh, boiling milk. And uh, it's uh, it's not good for you, but it sure is warming and tasty. So th these are, you know, these are communal rituals that are ma that maybe require a little more work than uh, than uh, your day to day drinks, but uh, they are fantastic at the holidays and uh, they really pull people together and get people participating and sharing. So it's really fun for that. And a lot of them have sort of surprising histories that we delve into in, in the companion to spirits and cocktails. I think, you know, one of my favorite anchors is one about the Tom and Jerry written by, um, you know, really one of the best bartenders on the planet Earth, Audrey Saunders, um, you know, kind of which debunks a lot of of the, the ideas about the drink and then also provides her own recipe for it. The book itself has dozens and dozens of, of recipes that you know um, have gotten the wonker seal of approval as well as our <laughs> um other uh illustrious contributors so i mean it's it's kind of a cool thing to have you know many of the world's foremost drink and spirits experts like agree upon um such things and uh have it all at your fingertips and it's, it's nice also to like prepare a drink and be able to like quickly look up its history i mean i know that i will be forever grateful not to have to search through notes and other books and all of my research and know that it's all nice and tidy and, and right at a fingertips, <laughs> right at my fingertips. As tip. up to date as we can make it. You know? Exactly. And just, you know, oh, right. That's double check the history of Tom and Jerry had double check the history of this drink. And then as you make it for your, you know, friends and family, you can not only, you know, pour out a, a drink for them, but also ladle out a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of spirits knowledge, a little bit of liquid history for, for all of them to enjoy. So before we move on to the next question, what are some holiday drinks from around the world? So uh, there there are all kinds of uh, holiday cocktails uh, and, and mixed drinks. Uh, most of them communal. Uh, there's Rompope in Latin America. There's uh, m maybe my favorite because I'm a pyromaniac, Feuerzangenbola in Germany, where you... Uh, uh, soak sugar with high proof rum and uh, light it on fire over a pot full of uh, citrus and wine and uh, let the sugar melt in in run runlets of flame into the uh, runnels of flame I think is the word in in into the uh, in, into the pot and uh, as you ladle uh, flaming alcohol over it and uh, that 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 to me is just a blast, and it all is very exciting for people. Uh, so that's that's uh, pretty pretty uh, pretty great. Mulled wine is all kinds of mulled wines are popular, uh, you know, with 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 uh, spices and et cetera. You you go to Paris, it's sold in stalls on the street at Christmas time. It's very it's very fun and exciting. And uh, there's there's all kinds of traditions like that. The Anglo-Saxon tradition or the English tradition of, of hot punch and uh, Tom and Jerry and, and all that stuff, and, uh, hot toddies, uh, and, uh, hot whiskeys in Ireland, uh, uh, that's also very popular. I mean, that, that also spreads beyond uh, the borders of uh, the English-speaking countries. Those have become kind of global property, which is a fine thing. And, and I think all over, in a lot of places around the world, there are versions of some kind of like egg punch, you know, where we see like coquito and mm -hmm. um and and you know in the Caribbean and different types of where people are using different base spirits, whether it's rum or you know whatever the local spirit is, um, you know, and then uh, you know I, I think one of the commonalities is basically 
wherever people are. It's usually like some kind of communal bowl, right? Where, you know, in colder climates, it's something that is often warm to, to warm you, you know, up. And, you know, as, uh, you know, as, as Dave likes to always say, nothing brings a room together like a big bowl of punch. And I think that's definitely true during the holidays, wherever you are. I get that quote right. <laughs> yeah, close enough. <laughs> it's different every time. <laughs> so kind of following on from that with people making drinks for friends and family, if someone is feeling a little nervous about the cocktail making techniques, uh, but they're looking for a new drink to make around the holidays to delight their party guests, what would you recommend that they make and why? Well, there's a, you know, the, there are something like uh, almost 250 cocktail recipes in the book. So there's a lot to choose from. When you're nervous about something, I love being able to do it in advance and then have something very simple to do for the for the people when they show up. Because when nobody's watching, you can relax and you know take your time and you don't feel the, the pressure, you don't get flustered, you don't put things out of out of order. So for me, a bowl of punch is is, is the greatest because you do all the work while you're sitting around in your bunny slippers and then uh, you put on your nice clothes and your 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 people show up and all you have to do is grate a little nutmeg on top and ladle it out, which is very simple and uh, pleasant work and you can talk the whole time because you don't have to really follow a whole bunch of uh, procedures that might not be uh, habit yet. So so that that's an easy one. But other ones, uh, the Negroni, again, is always welcome. And that one, three equal parts, you can build it on the rocks in a glass. So uh, you just really need to have three bottles in front of you and put a splash of this, a splash of that, and a splash of the other thing. And uh, and it will, it will work. So that one's very easy and it's red and festive, a little bit bitter to remind us of you know the people we've lost in the year and also a little bit sweet to remind us of the pleasure we've had so it's and strong because you need strong at the end of the year so it, it's all uh that works pretty well for me and, and we also have a, a whole section that dave wrote about kind of the art of making drinks kind of the practical part about it so you know if you're feeling a little bit um nervous about making drinks for for other people <laughs> you could brush up um, by reading that section. I think it's all the way it's in one of the appendices at the back of the book. So uh, flip to the, the the end of it and of the, of the volume and you'll, and you'll find that. So that helps a little bit and also just explains things like measurements and, you know, ratios and uh, techniques. So that should hopefully make you feel a little bit more comfortable. And also like yeah. we try to, we try to make the recipes as like, friendly as possible you know it, it, it's it's a little bit more like baking i think uh, making drinks often where it's a little bit more straightforward so obviously you can customize and tailor it to however you see fit but at least you know that like if you follow the directions it's going to be fail safe and you know you'll you'll get the handshake from paul hollywood at the end so uh, <laughs> you should be all fine <laughs> thank you very much for that so kind of lastly and you may have part partially already answered this but what are some of your favorites on a on a cold winter's night Ooh, well for me a, a, a uh I, I grew up in uh, new england you know the uh the the oldest settled part of the united states uh, at least by by europeans and uh they were have a pretty maritime tradition so i grew up with hot butter drum uh on, on my mother's side uh, and my grandmother used to make it in the in the in the fireplace by heating up a poker and thrusting it into a uh, mug full of flavorful Jamaican rum, sugar, water, and a lump of butter. And uh, for the kids, we'd get just a little splash of rum. But you know, the grown-ups they'd splash it out, uh, splash it about a little more enthusiastically. Uh, but for me, that's you know, sort of the ultimate warming. Uh, winter drink is a mug buttered rum by the fire, but that's pretty rustic, I have to say. Other people prefer something maybe a little more sophisticated, but uh, that one really works for me. And you can just leave out the butter and you've got a hot toddy, which, as we mentioned, is is uh, pretty, pretty great and warming. I think that we, especially this holiday season, of all holiday seasons, we could all use like a comforting, decadent drink. And there is no more comforting, decadent drink in my mind than eggnog and like not the store-bought version but made from scratch which 
it is a lot of work. There's a lot of egg separating and whipping. It's almost mm -hmm. like you're making meringue, but it, it is really delicious when done from scratch. And that's kind of for me like a once a year kind of drink where if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, you should do it right. And you know, you're not gonna do it every day. So it's kind of funny. We have a whole entry about eggnog, including the recipe. You know, I also kind of think, you know, during the winter when when things are very cold and often, um, at least in, in New York, when it's forbidding to go outside, my mind wanders to more um, warmer climates and uh, places where it's, you know, it's sunny year round. And I find myself gravitating towards things like, you know, margaritas, dark and stormies, mm -hmm. something that, you know, reminds me of, you know, Mexico or the Caribbean, where I don't have to wear three coats and a sweater um, outside. So, you know, I, you know, again, the book has long entries about those those types of drinks too. If you want to do a little bit of, you know, uh, armchair travel um, without leaving your home bar to a, a warmer <laughs> destination. <laughs> so I, I kind of go back and forth between, you know, the the Irish coffees of the world and and the margaritas or the mojitos and and all of these drinks have fascinating history so uh hopefully we'll put you in a warmer state of mind as you're drinking your drink and, and reading about these uh the history of these concoctions thank you very much for that and thank you very much for joining us on the oxford commons all that remains to say is congratulations for the publication of your very impressive book with over 1150 contributions and um i wish you a happy holidays well, uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks for having us. And uh, we wish you a very happy holidays, too. And uh, hopefully we'll make it over to the UK as soon as possible. We miss you guys. <laughs> we feel like we've been <laughs> separated for a while. And uh, that that hopefully that will change very soon. Absolutely. And, and Dave, maybe we can even convince Dave to make the ultimate hot warming cocktail, the Blue Blazer, where you light on fire the alcohol and you send it between two metal tankards, which is only for the professionals. I have not tried it myself since it's so intimidating, but uh, <laughs> that was best left for uh, a uh, very experienced hand behind the bar, but uh, that would be a lot of fun. That would be fun. For our discussion on Christmas traditions, we're returning to a Christmas long, long ago. Well, the pre-pandemic world of 2018. We now pass our episode over to the host of Oxford Comment Past, Caitlin Phillips. Jerry Bowler, author of Christmas in the Crosshairs, 2,000 Years of Denouncing and Defending the World's Most Celebrated Holiday, is here to help examine the entire sweep of Christmas history. He provides a global scope of its influence in his book. Let's hear more from Jerry. Hi, I'm Jerry Bowler. I'm a Canadian historian, and uh, my specialty is the places where popular culture intersects with religion. So I've been studying Christmas, uh, social history of Christmas for the past 25 years or so. I've uh, written a number of books on it, um, The World Encyclopedia of Christmas, Santa Claus, a Biography, and uh, the latest uh, was Christmas in the Crosshairs, which was about 2,000 years of arguing about the world's most celebrated holiday. Can you give us some um, examples of holiday traditions from around the world? Holiday traditions are innumerable. Um, there are places where dates differ, for example. We tend to celebrate on um, December 25th. Uh, the Orthodox Church will celebrate it on January 7th. Uh, the Ethiopian Church will celebrate it even later. Food varies all around the world. Uh, North America, well, we love to sit down to a turkey dinner. Uh, in Australia, they'll be eating uh, barbecue on the beach. In Japan, uh, they love a very sweet Christmas cake and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Eastern Europe, they will put a carp in their bathtub for a number of days before Christmas to clean it out, and a carp will be on the table for their Christmas dinner. Magical gift bringers are universal, but they're not always Santa Claus. Uh, Santa Claus uh, in North America, certainly, but he'll be called Father Christmas some places, uh, Père Noël in the French-speaking world. The Three Kings, the Magi, also bring gifts in the Spanish-speaking world. There are female gift bringers, uh, some of them very uh, benign and benevolent, like the Bafana in Italy. There's uh, some scary ones, like uh, the uh, Central European Perkta the Disemboweler, who might uh, split you open or give you a gift, depending on how uh, she happens to be feeling at the time. 
I do love the mix of a uh, horror and the holidays. There's something really kind of unnerving, and yet it's so cold out. It's kind of nice to be also a little scared. <laughs> well, um, you have to remember that that Christmas uh, develops in the pre-industrial world where there is no artificial light. The, the only light we have would come from uh, a fire or candles, and it's the darkest time of the year. So uh, European folklore is full of ogres and werewolves and witches, uh, all kinds of monsters that, that hate the idea of the birth of the baby Jesus, and so rage furiously uh, against humanity. So we, we have all kinds of very, very scary stories. In many countries, uh, the gift bringer uh, himself or herself is scary. Uh, the uh, Scandinavian gift bringers were uh, very mischievous and uh, in, in animal shapes. The Finnish uh, Santa Claus is still called Yodapuki. He looks like Santa Claus, but he still retains the name of the Yule Goat, um, who would uh, knock you over as soon as look you in the eye. Well, and our concept of Santa in the red suit and sort of apple cheeks is, is somewhat new, too. Um, how have rituals across the world changed over time? Uh, change comes uh, for all kinds of reasons. For example, for the first thousand years of Christmas, gifts were um, not particularly given to children. They, they tended to be part of the, uh, the social contract up and down the social ladder from inferiors to superiors and down the ladder from superiors to their, their minor nobles or so on. Peasants would often have Christmas gifts of, of food and drink uh, sort of built into their feudal oaths, so the Lord had to give them hospitality at, at Christmas time. It's only around the year 1200 that we have some interesting changes with the, the appearance of the first magical gift bringer uh, and the invention of uh, St. Nicholas. Uh, St. Nicholas had been around for centuries, but uh, now he is uh, deemed to be the saint that brings uh, little gifts to children in early December, which is his saint's day. So f for centuries, we have uh, St. Nicholas as the magical gift bringer. We have St. Nicholas fairs, uh, St. Nicholas uh, gingerbread cookies, and so on. And then in the 1500s, the Protestant Reformation comes in in Western Europe and abolishes the cult of saints. So out goes St. Nicholas. That leaves uh, parents in Protestant Europe with the problem of who brings the gifts on Christmas. So they invent an interesting kind of figure called the Christ child, uh, which isn't quite the baby Jesus. It, it'll be a, a young woman, probably dressed in, in white. Though she has replaced St. Nicholas, she lacks some of the things that St. Nicholas brought to the table, which was the ability to scare children into good behavior and the ability to, to carry large, heavy packs. The gift bringer, which is now called uh, the Christ child, or in France, Le Petit Noël, or in, in Germany, uh, Das Christkindl, now has uh, very scary helpers. Uh, furry, shaggy creatures that will, will carry uh, whips or chains to rattle at the kids or, or uh, baskets or bags to carry them away in. Um, almost always clothed in fur. And uh, you can tell from the names of these monsters that, that accompany uh, the Christ child that the name of Nicholas has just been transferred to them. So um, in, in German, for example, Peltznickel or Belsnickel, which means uh, Nicholas in furs, or Ruhklaus, which means uh, rough Nicholas. And it is this shaggy, furry creature that's going to be one of the elements that eventually uh, turns in, into Santa Claus. So that's, that's one of the reasons um, things change, a huge religious uh, revolution. Then in, in many countries in the 20th century, there'll be uh, political revolutions, Marxist revolutions will view uh, anything religious with, uh, with great uh, distrust. So in, in the Chinese Communist Revolution, uh, Christmas is simply abolished. In uh, Nazi Germany, Christmas was too deeply embedded to abolish, so the Nazis tried to co-opt it to replace uh, worship of the baby Jesus with Christmas carols like Silent Night that, uh, that praise uh, Adolf Hitler. In the Soviet Union, they try to shift the holiday festivities uh, to the New Year and to stage atheist demonstrations against people who go to church on Christmas Day. Or you have huge economic change, like the Industrial Revolution. Uh, when that comes to North America and, and Western Europe, there's a shift in Christmas festivities. Christmas festivities for a long time was all about food and drink, 
but now after the Industrial Revolution, the focus is on uh, manufactured gifts and toys for children. You can see traditions changing when children move out. Uh, parents no longer celebrate necessarily in the same way as when they had kids around. And if the kids marry, they might marry into a family that has different Christmas traditions. So you end up with uh, family negotiations that, that produce new practices. Uh, for example, uh, what do you have for Christmas dinner? Or when do you open the presents? Or how long do kids have to stay in bed before they come down? And then you have uh, a lot of attempts by commercial interests and in, in movies uh, to uh, invent new traditions. And those are almost always failures. So the only ones that uh, have really succeeded have been uh, the Chicago department store that invented Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, so you mentioned symbols there a bit, and, and you know we've lived so long with the Christmas tree and with Santa and with reindeer. Do you see a point where we get past those or, or beyond those in, in holiday uh, you know symbols, or are those sort of always uh, going to be with us? And you did mention Rudolph, but um, there's Elf on the Shelf and you know some of these other you know supposed new traditions. Can you talk a little bit about those? An example of one that didn't succeed was, was Ivory Soap. Ivory Soap had a series of advertisements that tried to convince families that Santa would be dirty coming down the chimney, so it would be a kindness not to leave out uh, milk and cookies, but to leave out a basin of water and a bar of ivory soap. Um, movies, uh, dozens of new Christmas movies every year that um, amend the Santa Claus myth by killing him off or giving him uh, a family, or giving him uh, labor problems with the elves. Uh, none of those have stuck, and, and I don't think they will. The two primary symbols of Christmas, uh, the nativity scene and Santa Claus, uh, have existed for so long because they're successful, because they do things that are good for the culture and for the family. So I don't think we're going to see much change in either of those. Uh, Christmas trees are interesting. They're, they're a rather new phenomenon in North America. Uh, they've been around in Europe since the 1500s, but uh, it came to North America really with German settlers and, and became popular only in the mid-1800s. But we've seen those go through a number of changes. They used to be small, sitting on the tabletop, and uh, then they were large, but uh, lit with candles. That was a, a fire hazard uh, disaster. So we had them replaced by natural gas, cast iron Christmas trees hooked up to the, the gas supply. Electric lights came in, everything got safer, then we went through the period of aluminum trees. There are a number of businesses that will rent you a Christmas tree and will take it back and then replant it. Things like the Christmas tree and the various kinds of ornaments that, that put on it are, are recent and frequent changes in fashion. The the rise of charity, or not the rise of charity, but the rediscovery of Christmas charity in the 19th century uh, has become very big and, it, and is now uh, a part of family gift bringing. Yeah, it is nice to get reminded that getting uh, gifts is fun, but giving something uh, can sometimes be even more fun. Oh, I, I think so. The whole point of the religious meaning of Christmas is giving. The Santa Claus myth is itself a gift, because we have here a very peculiar situation where parents who could get the gratitude of children for all the uh, lavishing of gifts, parents deflect it onto this mythical, magical creature, uh, Santa Claus, and provide the element of, of fantasy in the lives of children, of expectation, of a heightened sense of time. Even when kids find out the truth about Santa Claus, uh, they love to be included into the conspiracy. They love to become part of the adult clan uh, that now knows the truth and doesn't reveal it uh, too soon to the younger siblings. So your book is called Christmas in the Crosshairs. Can you talk a bit about uh, controversy surrounding uh, Christmas from you know, way back when, uh, up to a more modern uh, take on it, where we've kind of dubbed it the war on Christmas. Dig into some of the more controversial sides of Christmas. People have been arguing about Christmas even before there was a Christmas. The early church had disagreements about whether or not to celebrate the birthday of Jesus. Birthdays were not a Christian thing that belonged to the pagan world. Uh, they particularly honored 
uh, emperors, people who were oppressing Christianity. So it took a, a couple centuries before Christians agreed, no, well, we have to talk about the birthday of Jesus, because there are people out there who believe that Jesus was always pure spirit, that he never had a human body. And so the church has to emphasize the very physical uh, human aspect of Jesus, and that means the birth in a particular place, a particular time. By the 200s, there, there's a desire to celebrate the birthday of Jesus, but the question then is, when do we do it? What time of year? A lot of people think incorrectly that December 25th was chosen because it was the time of the pagan holiday season. Most historians don't believe that anymore, and uh, they believe that for various uh, rather complicated calendar reasons that have to do with uh, very high theological analogies, uh, it, it ends up uh, on December 25th, uh, very close uh, to the midwinter season. So uh, Christians in, in the west of Europe, in Rome, and Gaul, and Britain, uh, celebrated on December 25th, but the Eastern churches, uh, churches in uh, Alexandria or Jerusalem or Constantinople, use a different calculation based on a different calendar, and they, they want to emphasize January 6th. So there's arguments about that. So we have centuries of arguments about Christmas just as, as Christmas is being invented. And then the next big fight, which, which goes on even today, so it, it's lasted for about 1,700 years, is the fight uh, to keep non-Christian elements out of the celebration of, of the nativity of Jesus. And, and that's a losing battle. But the church manages to keep some of the celebratory elements of uh, the non-Christian world out. Dancing in animal skins, for example, not part of Christmas, um, but uh, greenery is, and, and the same with uh, light and, and candles and gifts. These were all part of the calends of January or the Saturnalia Festival. There's been arguments for hundreds of years about uh, what kind of things can be harmlessly uh, acculturated and, and some things that, that have to be kept out. And then we have, in the 15 and 1600s, the whole argument about whether or not Christmas should be celebrated at all, coming from the Puritans, who want to have nothing to do with it. The holiday was not commanded by God, and so it's idolatry. It's, it's something produced by man. So that fight, well, it's still going on. Um, and I have a quick question for you. Have you ever researched a tradition that you then integrated into your own family's tradition? Or is there one that you think uh, would be fun for, for people to integrate into their family traditions? That's a really good, good question. Um, I've done a fair bit of traveling, and everywhere I go, I try to pick up something new about Christmas. So a couple things that, that I've picked up are um, a traditional Christmas Eve French-Canadian uh, meat pie uh, called tortier. Uh, for French-Canadians, that, that's what they tend to eat in the feast they call the Réveillon, uh, which happens after uh, midnight mass on Christmas Eve. But I'm, I'm not going to stay up that late, so we have it for Christmas Eve dinner. Also, though I'm, I come from a Protestant background and really never had a nativity scene, we, we've gotten pretty big on nativity scenes. I, I collect them uh, from around the world, um, they're, they're wonderful, and I, I try and make sure I, I've got a, a wide uh, selection. Uh, when I went to Naples, uh, I, I was just in heaven because they have an entire street populated only by stores that sell nativity scene figures. So you can populate an entire village or city with little three or three and a half inch uh, creatures that uh, take up much of my living room at Christmas time. Oh, that sounds lovely. <laughs> Well, Jerry, thank you for joining us. Uh, it was quite a pleasure speaking with you. Always a pleasure to talk about Christmas. We want to thank our guests, David Wondrich and Noah Rothbaum, editors of the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, for their spirited discussion on holiday drinks. We also want to thank Jerry Bowler, author of Christmas in the Crosshairs, and Caitlin Phillips for their archival interview, recorded for episode 51 of the Oxford Commons in 2018. Check out our show notes on the OUP blog for an excerpt from each of these books, along with a suggested reading list that provides even more context behind the traditions of our winter holidays and the world of alcoholic drinks. Our next episode, the first of the new year, will premiere on the last Tuesday of February 2022. 
In the meantime, be sure to subscribe to the Oxford Commons wherever you regularly listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher. Our podcast can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic. Lastly, we want to thank the crew of the Oxford Commons for their assistance on today's episode. Episode 68 was produced by Stephen Philippi, Erin Cox and myself, Tom Willard. Happy holidays from us at the Oxford Commons. Thank you for listening.